If you take your Bible with me and uh, open up to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, we've made it through chapter 1, so we're in number 2. Hope you keep in your mind two prevailing themes from chapter 1. And of course you know we're talking about trials and we all don't like trials or we don't want them to be part of our lives but uh, the Lord wants us to understand that he brings them in our lives and that we need if we truly love the Lord we're going to love those things he brings into our life and that's tough it's hard to say that but that's what the Bible is telling us been teaching us and we know that the trials plus our assurance of our salvation is going to give you joy and then our trials plus the Word of God is going to bring what? Holiness, sanctification in our life. And as we go on to chapter 2, we're still going to be talking about trials. Trials, trials, trials. But here, that the trials in our life, God uses them to separate us from the world. To separate us. Who wants to be separated from the world? Who maybe doesn't understand what that means for sure? Separation from the world. One's the honest one back there doesn't quite know what that is. Emma. She just likes to raise her hand too, don't you? <laughs> no, she said. Uh, so as we get in here, we're going to be getting, looking at separation. Trials are going to cause us to be separated from the world if we let uh, God do in them what he should be doing in them. And... Last Sunday evening when I introduced chapter 2, I told you when we started talking about separation, there are two extremes, and those two extremes are wrong. The first extreme begins with self-something. Self-worth, self-reformation. When, when God talks about separation in our lives, and to be separate from the world, he does not say that you need to be self-reforming yourself. Does that make any sense? <clears throat> I hope it does. We're going we're gonna <laughs> Crystal's thinking a little bit. What we've been doing, and I think in our Christian life, is when if you've come to know the Lord as your Savior, He gives you a new nature. But you also have something else. What's it called? The old nature. And what many people are trying to do that become Christians is they want to reform the old nature. What does the Bible say to do with the old nature? Kill it. Mortify it, right? And we want the new nature to come up in our life. What we've been trying to do is self-reform that old nature. And I'm going to tell you, it isn't going to work. You can do whatever you want to do. Most psychologists, most, not all. There are good Christian psychologists that are out there. But most psychologists are trying to do what with the old nature? Reform it! They're trying to reform the old nature. And any psychologist has to start with one spot. And where is that? The heart. Who is Jesus Christ to you in your life? Then we can begin doing what God wants to do in our lives. Self-reformation is an extreme. If you're a Christian, I mean, be honest. And I'm going to be honest. I've been a Christian a lot of my life that I've tried to self-reform the old nature. I've been trying to self-reform the old nature. And that isn't what the Bible tells us to do. It's different than that. The other extreme is once we become a Christian... What indwells us as a Christian? The Holy Spirit. And some of us, it was self-reformation, or not self-reformation, but when we come to Christ, we think the Holy Spirit's going to do what? He's going to do all the work in your life. Guess what? You can sit on the sidelines, and you don't have to do nothing. I've been a Christian now for about 25 years. And I believe without a doubt, the Holy Spirit of God is in me. But He doesn't do all 
the changing. I mean, he does do some changing, but he's going to ask you and I to do some things. We have to do some things. And we're going to see in the scripture here in chapter 2, he's going to tell us some things that you need to... Let's look, let's look. Verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking, as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Wherefore, <clears throat> laying aside means we're going to put some things off. We've got to lay them aside. Does it say the Holy Spirit's going to lay them aside? You're going to have to lay some of them aside. That's where we have to do some things. Is the Holy Spirit going to help you? Yes. Is the Holy Spirit going to do all of it? No, but He's going to be there. He's going to guide you. Are you going to be able to self-reform the old nature? You can try all you want, and it's miserable. It is miserable because you're going to keep coming back to it, and you're going to keep coming back to it. So there's two extremes, and the Bible says... Very clear that we've got two natures, and that's what we have to understand, the two natures. And I want to give you a, a couple uh, examples as we go through this morning. I'm not going to get into chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 until tonight. So we're going to look at a couple other scriptures this morning, kind of building some foundation up to get to verses 1 and verse 2. Real separation... Real separation rests upon the fact if you've really been saved. Okay, real separation rests upon the fact, have you really been saved? And I could ask you this morning, I want you to raise your hand if you've been saved. And a lot of people would raise their hand and say, what? I've been saved. And some people might not raise their hand that, that would say that, no, I haven't been saved. But if you've been saved, and the Holy Spirit is working in your life and moving in your life, there's going to be a desire for something in your life. What are you going to desire? The Word of God. You are going to desire Jesus Christ in your life. If you've been saved, you're going to desire Jesus Christ. And it could be a just a little test for you this morning. To evaluate, as we go through some of these scriptures, I want you to evaluate your heart if you truly have come to the saving grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. The Bible always says to examine what? Examine yourselves. Make sure your calling and election is sure. Make sure you're assured that you're saved. You see, if you are saved then there's going to be a desire in your heart for Jesus Christ. I remember the day that I bowed my knee to the Lord in our living room, and I got saved, and the Holy Spirit came in my life. I was a different person. You can ask my wife, what did I desire? The Word of God. I desired the Word of God, who the Lord was in my life. If you do not have that desire in your life, if it's not in your heart, there's a good chance that you truly have not come to the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. And you can do that today, can't you? You can invite Jesus into your life to be your Savior. Because I know, as I look at people, you don't know how many hours you've got to live. And you want the most important decision for you. The most important decision for me in my life is, who is Jesus Christ to you? And what are you going to do with Jesus Christ in your life? Most important question you can ever have, or that you can ever answer, have answered, or come to is, who is Jesus Christ? And when you know who He is, what are you then going to do with Him? True separation, true saving grace, you're going to have a desire Again, for the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want you to begin evaluating your heart right now. Do you have that overwhelming desire for Jesus Christ? Do you love Him? And if you do, do you know what comes out of that? You want to obey Him. 
That means you want to obey Him. You have a desire for Him to know Him, and you want to obey Him. And you're going to do what He tells you to do in your life. That's going to be a product of true salvation in your life. There are a lot of people that believe that they've been saved. And then you know what happens? They get saved! And they would tell you that I was not saved. I thought I was. But I really was not. You should have that burning desire in your life if you've been saved. For the Word of God, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't have it, who wants to blind your heart to make you think that you have when you have not? The enemy. The enemy wants to do that with you. So you, you begin the evaluation of your heart. What is, have I really asked Jesus Christ into my life to be my Savior? As we look at this separation, as you're thinking about that, as I'm speaking, God not only wants us to be separated from judgment and hell. Harlan got up here and testified a little while ago, didn't he? He's reaching out to a lady over at the manor that does not believe there's what? Heaven or hell? She says, I believe there's a God, right? But I don't believe in heaven and I don't believe in hell. So separation, when we come to Christ, that means are we going to face His judgment? And when I'm talking about His judgment, His wrath. Are we going to face that? We will not. Will we face hell? We will not. We will not. But the Lord wants us, what He's going to be speaking to us, He wants us not only to understand that we're going to be separated from His judgment and hell, but He wants us to be separated right here, right now on this earth. He wants us to experience separation right here and right now on this earth. He does. He wants us to be there. And I want to read 1 John to you. It's not very far from 1 Peter. So if you go to 1 John chapter 2. Verse. Verse 15. Who knows what all 1 John the first portions of 1 John is talking about. Anybody know? Brother Kurt was going to say, go ahead. Assurance. 1 John, first beginning of John, is talking about assurance that if you want, there's several tests that you can look at to know if you can be assured of your salvation. I'm not going to look at all those tests, but there is tests to see whether or not you've truly come to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And he says in verse 15, he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is what? Not in him. If you love the world and you love this system, what does it say there? You're not saved. Elaine says, the love of God isn't in you, right? You're separated from God. You are. Let me read it again. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Who is, who is the prince of the world? Satan is. Over the systems of of the world and the world passeth away and the lust thereof but he that doeth the will of God what abideth for ever abideth forever so the separation he wants us to know we are going to be if we're true Christians separated from his judgment and his wrath we are not going to face hell but we're going to be in heaven with him forever for all eternity but he wants you as a Christian here while you're walking in this flesh to experience separation from the world. And He gives us the ability to do that. 
And I want to look at a couple examples from the scripture that show that. Because if you are saved, and you've come to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, will there be separation in your life? There will be separation in your life. Because you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you want to be obedient to His Word, and you want to do what He says, and He is going to, that's going to pull you into separation. Now, is He going to use trials to help that in our life? He's going to bring these trials into our life to help us while we're here, what? Separate from this old or the old nature that we have within us. The couple examples that Paul gives, he gives one of where he's talking to the Ephesians. So if you come back a little bit from, from John and, and open to Ephesians with me, I want to get, share a couple of these examples. Ephesians chapter 4. Starting in verse 17. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. And really that, that little phrase that's right here is really beginning to start to speak to Christians. If we know who Christ is, then what we just read before isn't going to be a part of what we are. There's going to be something else that's different in our life. And he goes on and he says, If so be that you have heard him, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old what? The old man, the old man, which is what? Corrupt according to the deceit, to deceitful lust. If you've been trying to reform the old man, he's what? He's corrupted, and you're not going to be able to reform the old man. That's what he is. That's who he is. He is corrupted from sin from Adam and Eve when they sinned right off the bat. You are corrupt. He said, I'm going to read that verse again. It says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your what? Of your mind. If you have the Holy Spirit in your life, what does he connect with? Your brain, your mind, your soul, and your spirit, doesn't he? Connects with you. There is a, what, what do you call that when you get saved? There's another name for it. The new birth. The new birth. The old birth, we were born of our parents, weren't we? That nature, that person is corrupt. But there is a new birth. A spiritual birth, that's when we invite the Lord Jesus Christ into our life to be our Savior. We are born again. Holy Spirit comes in. You have a new nature. That means what nature do I want to feed? The new nature. I don't want to feed what? The old nature. I don't want to reform the old nature because it's going to die, right? It's going to die. It's going to die. Well, he goes on, verse 24, and he says, And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. You see the old man and you see the new man. What are we supposed to do with the old man, does it say here? Set it aside, right? What do you do with the new man? Feed him, or what's the scriptural word that we see here? 
What's it say about the new man? Do what with him? Put him on. Brother Kurt said it. Put him on. And the example is like a garment. Just think about a garment. We got garments on. We better have garments on. The putting off the old man is just like if we were to take your clothing off and you're casting it, what? Aside. Has anybody done anything with your clothes and they've been so soiled, they've been so dirty, it isn't going to do any good to wash them. You just need to burn them or throw them away. Has anybody done that? We've done That's what he's talking about, about the old man, right? You're to take off that old man, right? Take him off, and you're not to do what with him again? Don't put him back on, right? You take him off, you throw him away, you burn him, right? We kill him, we mortify him. We don't put him back on anymore. Who does it say we put on? The new man. Put on the new man. And I think of whose righteousness are we clothed in? Jesus' righteousness, aren't we? His clothing, His righteousness in our life. That's what we're to put on, aren't we? His. Somebody from Wednesday might be able to help me with this that comes on Wednesday night. The word, when it says to put on, it's the same exact words that we see in Ephesians chapter 6. What does put on mean? Marcia said it. It means to fully submerse yourself. If you were to jump into a, a pool of water, is the water going to cover you everywhere? It is. That's fully submerged. He put on the new man. Be fully what? Submersed in the new man. And what are we doing with the old man? Pushing him away. We're putting him off. Does it say anything about reform? The old man? I, I, I challenge you. You can read the scripture. You can read the scripture. You're not going to find a passage that tells you to reform the old man. But it's put it off and put on the new man. That's one example. Putting off, putting on. That's a separation from... What does the old man love? The world and sin and everything that I was about before I came to know Jesus Christ. The old man loves it. The old woman, we can say to him, using man, but it's, it means both. It doesn't mean just one. But the old nature, you love it. And what do you do with it? You feed it. Right? When you're trying to reform it, you're trying to feed it. You're trying to make it better. You can't make it better. You might morally think that you're better, but you're still tainted, aren't you? You're trying to wash those clothes that won't come clean. You're exactly right. Good illustration. You're trying to wash the clothes that won't come clean. It isn't going to happen. You can't reform, self-reform. There's only one way to be made new, and that's with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul gives us another example in... Uh, 1 Corinthians, and I want to I want to go there. If you, chapter five, and I'm going to start with verse one. What was the old? Was there an old movie that was Jekyll and? Is it Hyde? Jekyll and Hyde. What was going on with Jekyll and Hyde? What 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 was it? One was an evil guy, and one was what? A good guy, kind of a fight and a war kind of going on. Do we want to be Jekyll and Hyde? How many of us are Jekyll and Hyde? Re are you? Jekyll and Hyde, and you're, Jekyll and Hyde, you're trying to reform. A lot of times you're trying to reform that old, that old man or whatever it might be. Paul goes in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He gives us another example with the Corinthians. One of them he says put off and put on. We're going to get something else he tells us here. He says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is as not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. There's fornication. And fornication, fornication has a broad base, doesn't it? But somebody tell me, 
The Greek root word for fornication is what? What is it? Pornos. Porno. Pornography. All that stuff associated with pornography. All that stuff that's there. Sexually immoral things. All that stuff comes from fornication. Right here in the church there is fornication going on and as such that hasn't happened with other Gentiles. Gentiles were a group of people that were sexually immoral. But this was so beyond what they would do that what does it say? What does it say? What is it? Entering into a sexual relationship with the mother. It said, named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's what? Wife. Could be a step. Could be the actual. I think a lot of people say it's a stepmother that's here. Nonetheless, nonetheless, the Gentiles said what? I would never enter into that type of immorality. It is so beyond, but yet they were immoral. But this man, there's a man within the Corinthian church right here that is involved in this sin right here. And he goes on and he says, And you are puffed up, or you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. Paul wasn't there with him. He was writing the letter telling them that he was already judging the sin within him, wasn't he? That they needed to do something with this man that was amongst them. Verse 4, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. What was Paul telling them to do with this immoral man? Boot him out. You got to take him outside the walls of the what? The church. Because he's in the church. He's involved in fornication, isn't he? And I'm going to speak to If any of you are involved in pornography, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to speak it the way it is. If you're involved in pornography right now, the Lord says it is sin that it is not right, that you shouldn't, be about, you shouldn't be about it. It's fornication. What should happen to you if you are a professing Christian and you're in this body and you are practicing for that fornication? What should happen? We should take you out of the church. Do you know why? Because you bring it in with you right in the walls of the church. And that's what Paul's telling them. You need to take this person and you need to remove him because you've allowed him to be in there and you've encouraged it. You're saying it's okay. You say, no, you need to stand on the what? On the word of God. And when they let him go, when they send him out, what did it say about Satan right here? What was Satan going to do? Destroy the flesh. When that happens amongst, and it can happen, and one can be cast out. They're cast out that Satan would destroy the flesh. That hopefully, what would happen? They would repent. They would come back to know the Lord. Right? They'd repent of that sin. Come back into the... If they've repented and acknowledged that it's wrong, do we want them right here? Yes, we do. Don't we? We do. Well, Paul goes on and he talks about it a little bit more. He says, your glorying is not good. They were glorying over it. They were allowing it and saying it was okay. Your glorying is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Leaven. Who makes bread besides Chad? Chad makes bread. I heard it's pretty good. If you make bread normally, what do you put in that bread? Yeast. 
And the yeast goes throughout the bread, doesn't it? And it helps it what? Rise. Does it go through every part of that bread? It does. It works through all of it, doesn't it? And that's what it's saying about like with this sin. That the leaven, as it comes in, and we don't deal with it, what happens to each one? We're all, the whole lump, the whole body is infected by it. And what does he say to do with it? Cast it out, right? Get rid of it. Get rid of it. What's the exact words that the scripture uses here with it? Purge. You know, the only illustration I can give from purge, some of the law enforcement guys are going are to understand this more than others maybe. But there is a intoximeter machine that police people use. When somebody's been drinking, you bring them in and you have them blowing that intoximeter machine. Well, it, the machine goes through a process once you've blown the alcohol or the breath that's in there, and it says it's what? Purging. And if it's purging, what's it doing? It's cleaning it out, isn't it? That means that when another breath sample comes in, is it going to be infected with what was there before? No. It is completely purged out. It's gone. So he says here to purge, right? And what does that mean then? To clean it completely out. Purge it out. Now, aren't you thinking about the old man? Like we've been talking about. Separation in the world. Not only are we to put off the old man, what else should you be doing with the old man? Purge him out! Purge him out! Purge him out! Get rid of that uncleanness! Don't go back to reforming that old nature, that old man. Purge him out! Right? Purge him out! Put him off! Kill him! Burn him! Don't self-reform. If you've been self-reforming, you haven't been growing as a Christian. You've been running a little circle. You've been running this little circle that you're not ever going to get ahead of. If you want to get ahead, what are you going to put on? The new man. You're going to feed the new man. Chapter 1, what did we spend the whole, whole, most of that, last of that chapter dealing with? What place? What's it called? The Haggius, right? Is that where a lot of that's going to happen? Right there with the Word of God in your life is going to help purge out, help put off the old man. And you're going to feed who? The new man. You see, we've been getting it all wrong. Feed the new man. If you feed the new man or the new woman or the new kid, we'll call you a new kid. If you've been saved and you're a youngster, the new person, you've got to feed that nature. You've got to feed that nature if you want to grow. That's what he's going to be talking about in chapter 2. Trials are brought into our life to help you purge out and put off who? The old man. The old nature. You've got to see part of the trials in your life. Thank you, Lord. I've got to say that for a lot of the trials. Thank you, Lord, for bringing the trials in my life because you know what you're doing? You're purging out the old man. I'm putting off the, new, the, the old man. You're helping me, aren't you? But we, we don't do that. We, we go and keep our arm around that old man and we keep feeding him. The old one, we keep feeding him. We keep trying to grow him in us. No. Do you, got, do you, do you understand? I hope it's simple. I hope you see that it's simple. Don't reform the new man or the old man. We want to... Deal with the new man. The new man. You have if, you have, if you've come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, again, what is in you? The Holy Spirit. And Peter says, he calls it something else. He calls it the divine, the divine nature. We are partakers of the divine nature. That means the Holy Spirit in you connects with your spirit in your soul and He wants you to grow. That is the part you have to see is what? Eternal. 
Is that old eternal? That old man, what's going to happen to the old man eventually? He's going to die. And even if he resurrects, what's he become? What's he become? What's the old man become? The new, he becomes a new man. Doesn't he? When we are raised from the dead again, our, is our body going to be new? Is there going to be any part of the leaven in it? No. Not at all. Why would we be feeding it right now? Ask yourself that question. Remember I started. I started the whole, the whole beginning here with the question. Real separation begins upon the fact that you're truly saved. That you're truly saved. And if you're not saved, you cannot experience real separation in your life. And you're not going to desire God. You're not going to desire the things that are of Him, but you're going to be putting them aside. Are you really saved? Have you really come to the saving grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life? Has He really changed you? Has He made you new? Are you born again born of the Spirit, born from on high? Or are you still the old man trying to reform who you are, make yourself better? Remember we said before, is there anything good in the old man? You can try and say it all you want. You can try and make there to be good in the old man. But the old man is corrupt. The only goodness that we can have begins with Christ, the goodness of Jesus Christ in us. Sandy's going to play for us here. And I, I want to give you opportunity. If you've been, first of all, if you've been feeding the old man, for you to take time to, to, to realize you've been doing something that the Lord doesn't want you to do. You need to be killing. You need to be putting off. You need to be purging that old man. And you need to be putting on the new man, feeding the new man. If that's you as a Christian, that's what the Lord wants you to do this morning. To put off and to put on what He has for you. If you're not a Christian and you've never come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or maybe you thought you did, but you want to know for sure this morning. The Lord wants you to invite Him into your life to be your personal Savior. And I'm going to tell you, he can do a great work in your life. If you bow your heads with me, I want to give the invitation, the opportunity for you this morning to recognize who you are and who Jesus Christ is in your life. Is He your personal Savior? And if He is, and you know that, he tells you to put off that old and put on the new. But if you've never come to the Lord Jesus Christ today, and you want to invite Him into your life to be your Savior, I want to lead you in a prayer. And just pray with me. If that's you, right where you are, you don't have to raise your hand, you don't have to do anything, but if you want Jesus Christ in your life right now, I want you to pray with me. Father, I know that I am a sinner. And I know that your word tells me that this man, this woman that I am, is corrupt. Lord, there's not anything that's good that's there. And Lord, I know that you came to this earth to die for me, to die in my place, Lord, to give me eternal life. And I believe, Jesus, that you've risen from the dead and that you're seated at the right hand of God right now. And Jesus, I want to invite you to be my Savior. And I invite you into my life right now. To save me. To give me, Lord, the new nature. A new man. To be born from on high. To be born again. And I invite you in, Lord, right now. And I thank you that you've saved me. 
Now, Lord, give me the strength. Give me the strength to feed the new man and the strength to put off and to purge the old man from me. Father, I thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.